Lost and found. I lived in or around Bangor, Maine for 40 years before I made a pact with my best work friend, Paul O, and we both left our East Coast homes and moved to the mothership of the National Writing Project. A few months after my 40th birthday, I left my small hometown to move to Berkeley, California. From the time I started packing my own house, giving away more than half of my stuff to this very moment, the last three years have given me many opportunities to think about things lost and found. This summer, I went to a barbecue at my friend Barbara's house. Babs lives with two roommates in a big, beautiful apartment carved out of a big, beautiful Victorian in the middle of Emeryville. I took a salad in my favorite bowl with my favorite read-only set of salad tongs. The salad tongs, a gift from my old friends in Maine, who had brought them back to us from a semester that they spent in Copenhagen. When we left the barbecue, I brought home the bowl, but not the tongs, and then I promptly forgot all about them until the next time I served a salad. It actually took me quite a long time to figure out where they had gone, and then quite a long time after that to remember to ask Babs if she had my salad tongs. Actually, by the time I remembered, I was at her house for another barbecue in another season. When sitting at her table watching her mix up salad, I remembered to say, hey, do you have my salad tongs? They were stainless steel, they were kind of a funky design. There's a little silence, a stutter step, before she and another roommate broke the news that Katie threw those away. So that was that. My lost salad tongs were lost for good. Normally I wouldn't care, I mean, they're just salad tongs, but these salad tongs had come from Copenhagen and been brought to us by friends who also felt a little lost to me at this moment. I felt sad, but just a little, because the last three years have taught me a lot about loss and the way it can make room for discovery. I've been getting along for a few months without any salad tongs. We use our fingers. A few big spoons, maybe a fork. But on Friday night, the Girl Scouts and their moms came to our house for a dinner meeting. It was time to prep for cookie sales and the Pinewood Derby. We ordered pizza and Andrea brought a salad, but not her own tongs. The question, where are your salad tongs, yielded no tongs, <laughs> but a long story about how I lost them, which made us, all old married women, laugh in wonder at people who live with roommates and who would just throw away, throw away salad tongs. <laughs> the next afternoon, when my handsome Canadian husband went to the mailbox, he found, guess what, a brand new pair of salad tongs. They're beautiful and long-handled. They were in a clear bag and wrapped with a maroon ribbon. They're from William Sonoma. Very nice. <laughs> As usual, it took me a little while to put together the pieces, but this is what I believe happened. Barbara, who's a Girl Scout mom, was there Friday night, and her husband, Peter, works for William Sonoma. Her daughter is a Girl Scout. I think I said that. So there was Barbara hearing my story about the missing tongs and apparently having easy access to another beautiful pair. The thing about those missing salad tongs, it seems to me, is the way that they're being lost made room for me to find the other pair in my mailbox. The way the story of their loss helped me find a moment of shared laughter with a group of women who were not so long ago strangers to me. The way their loss made room for Barbara to perform this act of completely unexpected kindness. The way losing those tongs helped me find a friend. Masturbation, just to say. <laughs> <laughs> and just to say, um, we'll follow that up with uh, romance in the 20 year old marriage. Okay, so first of all, my marriage isn't really 20, it's more like 17. And truth be told, it was never exactly built on romance. It's not that there isn't any, but it's more like if my marriage were a house, then friendship would probably be the foundation, and romance would be more like window treatments. <laughs> All of which is to say, if you've been married to someone for 17 years and he says, let's go to a poetry reading, you should go. <laughs> Even if it's on a Tuesday night. Even if he wants to go because the poet in question is a beat poet and the work of his that your husband hopes to hear is 50 years old, drenched in testosterone and written by a much, much younger man than the one you're about to see. <laughs> If the poet your husband wants you to hear is Michael McClure, and he's reading from his newly published collection of Indigo and Saffron, then you should definitely go. First of all, poets and poetry aside, 
It has to be generally good for people who live together every day, day in and day out, to do something together that is A, outside of their shared living space, B, away from all the beasts and people who live in that space with them, and C, outside of their things that they generally do together every day. After the reading, handsome Canadian husband and I stopped by a bar on our way home. It felt like the first time in a long time that we talked about anything new, not that it was much. Which poems did you like? Did that poet remind you of so-and-so? Wasn't that crazy when that drunk guy outside knocked all over all the garbage cans and made all that racket? Stuff like that. Which, notably, is not stuff like, did you pick up the milk? What should we have for dinner? And does she, who is 11, have her homework done? But of all the things you might do together, maybe there's something special to be said for going to a poetry reading. There's something beyond your everyday life, or at least my everyday life, in poetry. All that attention to the just right word and the just right place to capture a feeling, a tone, a moment in time with so few words. The way poetry feels like an attempt to condense things to their essence. I don't know about you, but I feel like way too much of my life is filled with the non-essential. Too many emails, too many meetings, and much, much too much stuff. In a house full of English teachers, poetry, unlike other art that we might enjoy together, feels like something you can bring home with you. He had some Canadian husband said he felt like Jack Kerouac was right there with us in the poetry <laughs> <laughs> in the basement of Moe's, there especially when the drunk knocked down all the garbage cans. <laughs> That's the next poem I'm going to write, said handsome Canadian husband. Haven't seen that yet. Personally, I was struck by a series of haikus that McClure read. They ran the gamut from, gamut from funny to angry to poignant. I left my own haiku on handsome Canadian pillow, handsome Canadian husband's pillow that very night. Okay, this is very bad. <laughs> my handsome husband, Canadian temperament, American desires. See <laughs> how you know, I did that with the removal of the A in American so it really have only five syllables in the last line and still sound really American like George Bush. <laughs> Just kidding. I know it hardly even counts as a poem, but it is more romantic, trust me, than going to bed with these words on your lips. I think it was your turn to wash the dishes. Wow. <laughs>